Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you for coming today. I'm Laura Hamilton, and I'm here to welcome Jonah Berger to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Jonah is here today to discuss contagious, why things catch on, what exactly causes things to go viral, and how can you use triggers and social currency in marketing to make a significant impact on your business or bottom line. Jonah shares his six basic principles that drive things to become contagious. He is the James G. Campbell Jr. Assistant Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. His research has been published in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Science, and the Harvard Business Review. So please join me in welcoming Jonah Berger. Thank you guys uh, for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, and I want to start today with uh, just a question to sort of warm up the room a little bit. I know it's a jury afternoon. I know everybody had lunch. So I just want to start with a, a simple question. Here are three products or brands that most of us are probably quite familiar with. We have Walt Disney World, the self-described place where dreams come true. Uh, Honey Nut Cheerios, the delicious breakfast cereal that hopefully may cure your cholesterol, help your cholesterol. Uh, and last but not least, Scrubbing Bubbles. Some of us may be too familiar with Scrubbing Bubbles. It's like a bathroom cleaner uh, sort of product. All right, so which of these three products do you think gets more word of mouth? Is it Disney World? Is it Cheerios? Or is it Scrubbing Bubbles? Scrubbing Bubbles. Well, I'm going to ask you guys to vote. So let's see. So I heard Scrubbing Bubbles. How many people say Scrubbing Bubbles? OK. Somebody else want to take a guess? Disney World. Disney World. How many people want to go with Disney World? OK. Anybody else? I'll go, with go with Cheerios. A couple, <laughs> couple guys here and there going to Cheerios. All right. So uh, let's start with Scrubbing Bubbles, since that was the first guess. How many people said Scrubbing Bubbles? OK, excellent guess. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Uh, Disney World? Even better guess. Also wrong. It's Cheerios. <laughs> so ho, ho, I've been here for two minutes. I'm going to get there. OK, I'm going to get there. Come on, I'm going to get there. So I, I think this, this brings up two interesting points. First of all, we're not exactly sure which products get more word of mouth, which wouldn't be super important unless we want to try to get word of mouth for our own products and ideas. If we don't understand why things get talked about and shared, it's going to be really hard to get people to talk about our stuff. And second, if we had to guess, we got it wrong, right? Most of us pick Disney World, probably about 60, 75, 80%. Rest sort of picks Scrubbing Bubbles, and a couple of folks here and there pick Cheerios, and it's Cheerios. And I think this is just one particular stylized example, but I think it asks a bigger question, which is why do some products and ideas get talked about more than others? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the book that we just had come out called Contagious. Um, it's a, a fun read, a mix of science and stories, uh, talking about the sort of decade worth of research we've done in this area to understand why people talk and share. Uh, if you're interested, uh, all of the papers are in the back of the book, but you can also find them on jonahberger.com, my website. Uh, and if you're into Twitter and those sorts of things, you can uh, follow me at, at j1berger. So um, it goes without saying that word of mouth is really important. And I think most folks in the audience probably realize this already. But just in case, uh, people tend to believe things that McKinsey says. So here's a McKinsey quote, um, arguing that word of mouth generates more than twice the sales of paid advertising in a diverse set of categories. And indeed, in the past five to 10 years, there's been lots of very rigorous academic research uh, from marketing scientists, from economists, from others, showing the causal impact of word of mouth on sales. So uh, an extra book review, for example, uh, on Amazon, for example, uh, leads to about a five-star review, leads to about 20 more books being sold for a given book. More offline word of mouth about a restaurant leads to, on average, around $200 increase in sales for a, for a high-end restaurant. People have looked at Yelp. People looked at a host of domains, everything from skincare and mobile phones, a broad range of things, services. Across all these domains, it's clear that word of mouth has a bigger impact than advertising. Any idea why? That might be. Any thoughts? Yeah? Because you trust people. You trust people, right? So ads always say the product is good. They say 9 out of 10 dentists love this toothpaste, or you know, 4 out of 5 car drivers like the new Toyota. There's never an ad that says the product is bad, so it's hard to believe whether the ad is actually true. 
Whereas our friends will tell it to us straight, right? They'll tell us that they liked the product or they hated it, if it was good or if it was bad. So one is definitely that trust factor. The second is targeting. It's a little more nuanced, but, but equally important. And the idea here is it's very hard for advertising to perfectly target the right consumers. Right? So say you sell skis, for example. You may put an ad out there that says, hey, like new skis, we have some new skis. You put it in a ski magazine, for example. But a bunch of people who read that ad are not in the market for skis. Right? It's hard to find the exact right people. Word of mouth, though, is pretty targeted. If you don't have a baby, no one's going to tell you about a great store to buy baby clothes. If you don't like spicy food, no one's going to tell you about a really good Indian restaurant that has delicious curries that opened up right down the street. And so word of mouth is like a searchlight that looks through a social network and finds the people that are most interested in that particular idea or product. And so it's not surprising that referred customers, customers referred by existing customers, have a 13% higher customer lifetime value across the life of that customer. Right? You acquire better customers through word of mouth because they're people that would like the product or idea already. OK, great. So word of mouth is really effective. You might say, how do we get it? Fantastic. Let's jump on the bandwagon. And indeed, there's lots of interest these days in social media technologies. Things like Facebook, things like Twitter, uh, things like Pinterest now is, is really hot. Last year was Foursquare. Um, and technologies are great, but I think there's two problems with this approach. First of all, if you had to guess, how much word of mouth do you think is online? And by online, I mean on social media, I mean on reviews, I mean on blogs, compared to offline being face-to-face -face or, let's say, phone. 20%. How much? I heard 20%. How much? 40%. 12. 40%, 12%. I feel like I'm on the prices right here. <laughs> yeah. So I heard 20, 40, 12. Anybody else? Yeah. 10? I think it's hotter in certain areas than others. So that's definitely true. So younger folks, for example, not surprisingly, spend more time. Which sites are going to have much more word of mouth impact than other sites? Yeah, so there is some variation across products. But in general, the number is 7. 7% 7 of word of mouth is online. Not 70, not 17, 7. Right? And it's, it's surprising a little bit given all the interest in online word of mouth, given you know, hardly a day goes by without some article in a major news outlet about some new thing going on on some social media site. But if you think about it, one reason we think there's so much online word of mouth is we can see it. But even though we can't see all that offline word of mouth, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter, right? Think about the last time you had lunch with some friends. You talked about products and ideas. You spread things to one another. You change each other's behavior. Even though there's not a written record, it doesn't mean it's not important. And the second thing is by focusing so much on the technology, we forget about the psychology. So a few years ago, you might have heard that MySpace was the next big thing. You might have invested a whole bunch of resources in learning how to use MySpace. And today, those resources wouldn't really be well spent. Right? MySpace isn't popular anymore. Will Facebook be here in five years? I don't know. Not sure. Probably, but maybe not. Maybe we'll move on to something else. But what will stay the same is the psychology, why people talk and share. And so rather than focusing on the shiny new marketing technology that's out there, which is where we should spend some of our time, we need to think more about why people share things. And that brings me to a cat, DJ. So uh, this is a cat. It's not my cat. It's a picture I got off the web. Uh, of a cat playing a turntable. It's not a real turntable. It's sort of like a cat scratching post turntable. So imagine a little cat DJ with its thing. Anyone have any idea why I put a picture of a cat DJ in a talk about word of mouth and, and virality of online content? To catch our attention. Right? So if you ask many people what makes things viral, they will say cats. <laughs> the reason things go viral is cats. Cats make things viral. And that's a great idea, but as we can tell, it's not really true. Right? It's like saying that Bill Gates and Bill Clinton and Bill Cosby all have the name Bill and they're all famous, and so you should name your child Bill and that will make your child famous. <laughs> Just because there are some cat videos doesn't tell us why some cat videos succeed and some fail. And it doesn't tell us why cat things that have nothing to do with cats, like all the rest of the content on the web, is shared. Or offline content is shared as well. So uh, I'm going to put an X through the cat, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry for cat lovers out there. And instead, I'm going to talk about science. So I'm an academic. I wish I was a social media guru. Apparently, all you have to do to be a social media guru is have a theory. You don't need to have any data. And you just get to say that your theory is true, because you think it is. Um, but I'm a professor at the Wharton School. Uh, and to publish academic papers, you have to what? You have to go to South by Southwest. Ah, unfortunately, I was at South by Southwest this weekend. So I apologize. That doesn't, that doesn't devalue my academic credentials, but I did go there as well. Uh, I, I'm, the publisher has me on a tour, so I went there. I passed out some of these orange tissues. There, uh, here you go. You can have one. Um, 
they love them there. So if you want to have a couple extra uh, at the end of the talk. But so I'm going to talk about data. I'm going to talk about science. So we've done a host of things. We've looked at six months of New York Times articles, every article written by the Times over a six month period, over 7,000 articles, to look at which articles make the most emailed list and why. Controlling for where they're featured and who wrote them and how famous they are. What about the emotion or the useful information or the other aspects of the content itself might have led it to make the most emailed list? We've looked at hundreds of products and brands to look at why certain get more word and mouth than others. Everything from B to C to B to B, from fashion and uh, consumer packaged goods to cars and clothes and everything else you can imagine. And so by doing these investigations, we found again and again that the same principles seem to be driving people to talk and share. So it's not random, it's not luck, it's not cats, unfortunately. There's a science behind why things go viral or why people talk offline. And so I'm going to suggest that there's a recipe or a way to engineer content to make it more viral or talkable. Now I don't mean to suggest that by following these six things you can become the next Gangnam Style overnight. <laughs> I'm not guaranteeing a billion views. But it's like any recipe, right? The more of the ingredients you follow, the better the end product will be. We can, make thing, we can say things like a dose and extra standard deviation increase in anger leads articles to be 25% more likely to make the New York Times most emailed list. So we can say that if you add a dose of these things, and we've done it in experiments, things will be more likely to be talked about and shared. And what we're going to talk about today is how to craft contagious content. By content, I not only mean the advertising or marketing messages we build around our products, but also the products themselves. Right? You'll notice the cover of the book is orange. That's not chance. We built that cover to be orange based on what we've learned about what makes people talk about and share things. Right? Because it's more public, it's more observable. So it's the way we build our products for viral growth, the way we build our websites, and the way we build our advertising campaigns. By contagious, I mean more likely to spread from person to person just like a virus might. But the most important word here is craft. And what I'm going to argue today is that you can do this for any product or idea. It's not always easy. It's not always simple. But I'm going to show you that even boring, mundane products, everyday products, can get lots of word of mouth when they follow these principles. And last but not least, I just want to point out something here we can talk about more during the, uh, the question period if you're interested. How many people have heard about the idea of influentials, of opinion leaders, of mavens, connectors, salesmen? Okay, at this point, probably most people in the room are going to raise their hand. That's a really compelling idea. Uh, the Tipping Point is a great book. Uh, it was one of the books that got me interested in this space to begin with. But that book is half wrong. In the years that have followed since that book, academics have found that there's no support for the idea that certain people are repeatedly more influential over time. There's no data to suggest that's true. That doesn't mean influence doesn't exist. That means it's hard for marketers to find special people, to target them, to give them a product, to get them to talk about it, and do it all in a cost-effective way. And so rather than focusing so much on the messenger, I'm going to argue that we should focus more on the message itself. Because while there may be some people out there that are popular, there are many more people who are normal folks, just like us, everyday Joes and Janes. And what this talk is about is the psychology that drives anyone to talk and share, whether they have 10 friends or they have 10,000. Okay? So uh, I'm going to argue the six key steps drive people to talk and share. Um, I think you said we have until 5 after something, 15 after? OK, good. We'll see how far we get, depending on, on what folks are interested in. And please feel free, it's a small group, interrupt with questions if you have them. Um, these are six key principles we found to drive people to talk and share. Each is evidence-based, based on the work we've done in the field to date. I'm going to illustrate them, though, with stories, because stories tend to be a little more fun than boring academic uh, presentations. Uh, but behind each of these is rigorous research that we and others have done, and I'm happy to talk about that research if you're interested. And so I think, given the time we have, I'll talk about social currency, I'll talk about triggers, and then if we have time, I'll talk about stories. But if you're interested, there's actually a book in the back of the room, and many of you got it already, that talks about each of these. There's a full chapter on each of them and uh, explanations of how it works, the psychology behind it, as well as how to apply it. All right. So let me jump right in. Any folks from New York here? OK, good. You may know of this if you're from New York. So imagine you're in New York, if you live there or if you're visiting. Uh, one weekend, uh, you're down on the Lower East Side. You're walking around with friends or family members. It's late in the afternoon. You're sort of hungry. You're looking for somewhere to eat. So you notice a big uh, hot dog shaped sign at a restaurant that says, eat me on it, written what looks like mustard. So you say, oh, hot dogs? I like hot dogs. I haven't had a hot dog in a while. Why not? So you walk down a set of stairs into this restaurant called Criff Dogs. It's essentially a hot dog diner. Okay? Every hot dog you can imagine is on the menu. They have a good morning hot dog with bacon, eggs, and cheese. They have a hot dog with pineapple and green onions. And they have your normal sort of water dog with ketchup and mustard, uh, boring New York style hot dog. So 
You're eating your hot dog, you're sitting down, uh, you finish it off, when you notice right here on the side of one of the walls is what looks like a phone booth. A phone booth? I haven't seen a phone booth in a while. It's what like, uh, Clark Kent used to change into to become Superman, right? Slide open, slide open that door. So imagine just for kicks, you walk inside, you slide open the door, it's sort of cramped, but you notice on the side of the wall is a rotary dial phone. One of those old numbers you have to stick your finger into and go around in a circle. The younger folks in the room may not have even seen one of those in their lifetime. Uh, I remember one from when I was younger, but they're not really around anymore. Just for kicks though, stick your finger in, let's say the number two, go around in a circle, and hold the receiver to your ear. Someone will pick up the other line, and they'll ask you whether you have a reservation. Reservation? I'm in a phone booth inside of a hot dog restaurant. What, what would I have a reservation for? But if you're lucky and they have space, or if you happen to have a reservation, the back of that phone booth will open and you'll be led into a secret bar called Please Don't Tell. Now, Please Don't Tell has violated a number of laws of traditional marketing. No sign on the street, no sign in the restaurant, and you have to have a reservation. They've made it really, really hard to get into. Yet they've never advertised and every day they're full. The phone lines open at 3 p.m. for that night. People hit redial again and again, frantically trying to get through it. It took me personally <laughs> two weeks to get in there. Uh, two weeks to get in. By 3.30, all the seats are gone for that night. So how did they do it, right? They spread solely by word of mouth. Let me tell you some funny thing. They've made themselves a secret. Think about the last time someone told you a secret. What did you do with that information next? They told you not to tell a single soul. And what did you do? You told someone. Right? Because having access to secret information makes you look smart and in the know. Right? Because the information seems special, it seems more worth telling. And that's the idea I call social currency. Just like the car we drive and the clothes we wear, the things we say affect how other people see us. We want to seem smart and in the know rather than, let's say, not so smart and behind the times. And so we talk about things that make us look good rather than bad. It's status by association. We talk about things or other people talk about things that make us look in the know. So a couple of weeks ago, for example, you might have seen, and maybe this even happened to you, LinkedIn sent out an email to a bunch of their subscribers saying, hey, you have one of the top 10% profiles on LinkedIn. Okay? And I don't know if you got this from anyone else, but a bunch of people shared that with others, saying, hey, look at me. I have one of the top 10% profiles on LinkedIn. I can embarrassingly say my father did that to me, he sent it around, <laughs> saying, oh, hey, I'm one of the top 10% of profiles. Um, why did he do that? He did that because it made him look good. But if you notice along the way, he's talking about LinkedIn. He couldn't talk about that without spreading the word about LinkedIn and what they're doing. Even though it ends up actually that almost every active user of LinkedIn got that message because all the other non-active users are the other 90%. But by making people feel special, they got them to talk and share. Okay? So this is status by association. Play a game with me for a second. I want to develop this a little further. I want to see how much you can guess about a friend of mine based solely on the fact that she drives a minivan. Her name is Carla and she drives a minivan. How old do you think she is? 33. 35. 40. I heard a couple guesses. How many people would say between 35 and 45? Okay. Does she have kids? Yes. They play sports? Yes. yes. What sport do they play? Soccer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you a cheat sheet for the talk ahead of time while I wasn't looking at it, maybe? Just a little bit? So we made inferences about her solely based on the car she drives. We would do the same thing about this guy with a mohawk. It's not like he couldn't shop at the Gap or J. Crew. It's not like they would bar the door and say, no chinos for you, right? They wouldn't let him in. He could shop wherever he wants. But we assume that he doesn't shop at a store at the Gap because choices communicate information. Again, the car we drive, the clothes we wear, say things about us to others. And this is one of those funny things where you may be sitting there going, I don't do this, and that's okay. But look around the room and I bet you think other people do it. And other people are actually thinking the same thing about you. But it's okay if you don't think that about yourself. That's all right. We feel like we're alone in a crowd of sheep. We're not susceptible to social influence. Everyone else is. Trust me, we all do it as much as everybody else. But it's okay if you want to look at others and think it's them. That'll work too. But the idea is that just like choices, what we say says things about us. If you're always talking about new restaurants, your friends are going to assume you're a foodie. If you're always talking about sports, your friends will assume you know a lot about that. And so we pick things to talk about because they make us look good rather than bad. So in terms of how to apply this, there are two key ways I'll talk about today, and there are a couple more in the book. The first is to make people feel like insiders. And that's exactly what Please Don't Tell did. I'd imagine you go to that bar, or even you just find out about that bar. You want to tell someone else because it makes you look cool. I remember the first time my cousin told me about it, I was like, oh, I've got to go. This place is so neat. And I want to tell other people that I went because it's a neat, engaging experience. It makes me look like an interesting person. 
Was it good? Please don't tell. Yeah. It was good. I have to say, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't amazingly good, but it was good. They, they had good drinks. It was dark, dimly lit. They actually have uh, pictures of like taxonomy, sort of animals that have been, but like old style ones wearing like hipster clothes up on the walls. Um, and at the end of it, they actually give you this cute little business card um, that says, please don't tell. But they also give their phone number, so it's easy to tell others. It's a very good experience. It's, a good, it's, it's not the best experience I've ever had, but it's quite good. I can't complain. I actually like the hot dog restaurant also, personally, but I like hot dogs. Um, but think about how they did this. How do they make people feel like insiders? They leverage scarcity and exclusivity. Right? By making it seem like a scarce experience, an exclusive experience, they made people who got that experience feel really special, like insiders. Right? It's the same thing. I don't know if you've ever been to In-N-Out. Anybody been to In-N-Out? Yeah, it's a West Coast thing many people have been, right? So you might know that they have a secret menu. In addition to the five or six things that are on the actual menu, right, the hamburger, the cheeseburger, the milkshake, the french fries, there's also things like a two by two or a four by four or the flying Dutchman. And if you ever go with someone who's never been before, you often order those things or other people order those things because it makes them look like a VIP. It's like, what do you mean? How did you order that? It's not on the menu. You must come here so often. They must love you. You must be special. This is for In-N-Out. It's a hamburger chain. But because they make people feel like insiders, people like to talk about it and share it. McDonald's actually did the same thing with the McRib. I don't know if there are any McRib fans in the audience. Probably not, but maybe. Oh, a couple. So McRib was a sandwich that McDonald's made. It did OK, but it wasn't doing extremely well. They wanted something else to get away from their chicken-focused menu. So they had a chef come up with this pork-based sandwich. There's actually no rib meat in it, not surprisingly. It's sort of intestinal and other sorts of meat, mostly. <laughs> it's not the best thing for you in the world. You would think about why would someone get excited about this? And indeed, people were sort of excited, but not enough. So they took it off the menu. But now, every once in a while, they put it on the menu in certain locations for a limited time. And people go nuts about a sandwich that's not even made of actual rib meat, right? <laughs> a McDonald's sandwich is like 2 or $3, but because it's special, because you can't always get access to it, it makes them feel like insiders. The second way to apply this is to find the inner remarkability of a product or idea. And by inner remarkability, what I mean is remarkability is something that's surprising, novel, or interesting, worth remarking on. And this, though, is a place where I want to come back to that word craft and this idea of inner. So you might think that certain products are naturally remarkable. Things like, I don't know, new high-tech goods, uh, maybe things like hidden bars are really remarkable. What's a product that's not very remarkable? Cheerios. Cheerios. Floor Cheerios. Wax. Floor <laughs> wax. Soap. Cable TV. Cable TV. I was doing uh, an executive education session yesterday at Wharton uh, and some of the executives, a global CEO program, and one guy was like, I sell cement. Okay? <laughs> there is nothing less remarkable, he was arguing, than cement. Okay? You could even think of household appliances, right? things like a dishwasher or a blender. Let me show you how a company got over 100 million views for a video about blenders. I love my new iPhone. It does everything. But will it blend? That is the question. You guys are going to like this one. Let's find out. It's going to go viral internally today, right? I think I'm going to push the smoothie button. <laughs> you will remember nothing else about my presentation except this moment. This will be your favorite part. It'll all be downhill from here. At this point, people start clutching their phones to make sure they're safe. <laughs> I smoke. <laughs> Don't breathe this. That's all that's left. Now, you fans on YouTube have asked me to blend an iPhone. So I did it. But I have another. I'm going to put this on eBay. <laughs> so how many people found that at least a little bit remarkable? A little bit? Yeah. This is a blender. Okay? If they can do this with blenders, you can do this with anything. Let me tell you about how this happened, because the story is a little bit useful. They had a new marketing hire. His name was George Wright. His first day in the office, he comes in. He noticed a pile of sawdust on the floor. He turns to one of his colleagues. He says, are we remodeling? Why is there sawdust on the floor? What's, what's going on? And they say, no, the CEO is doing what he tries to do every day, break blenders. So CEO would take two by four pieces of wood, golf balls, marbles, Bic lighters, anything he could find, chuck it in the blender, and see if the blender was tough enough to handle it. And the marketing guy was like, this is amazing. 
So he took a $50 budget, not 50 million, not 50,000, 50 dollars, and filmed his CEO. You all laughed at that guy. That was the CEO of the company. <laughs> That's why he's a goofy guy. He's an actual CEO, not an actor. Got him a white lab coat, got him those glasses, filmed the videos of him blending stuff, and put them online. And they got thousands upon thousands, eventually million upon tens of millions of views. This clip has over 10 million. The set has over 150 million. Now people tune in for the new episodes of what they're going to blend next. Every time a new tech good comes out, they see will it blend. They've got people tuning in to find out about a blender. Okay? They can do this with a blender. Anybody can do it. It's about finding the inner remarkability. It's not just that certain products are naturally remarkable and others aren't. By thinking about whatever makes a particular product surprising or remarkable. It's not even clear, by the way, that other blenders can't do this. Right? But he showed the power of the blender. Sales went up 750% after this. Because nobody really cared about blenders, and now suddenly blenders were exciting. And so by finding the inner remarkability, you get some social currency, you seem in the know, and you share it with others. So that's, that's the first principle we're going to talk about, social currency. The next I want to talk about is triggers. And social currency is sort of more fun, it's sort of sexy. Uh, it's hidden bars, blenders, iPhones, that's sort of cute, fun. Triggers are a little more boring, but equally important. Um, and I want to start talking about triggers by putting an example up that many of us are probably familiar with, uh, and that is Rebecca Black. So how many people know Rebecca Black and her song Friday? A couple people. Okay. Let me play it for you for just a second for folks that, that don't know. Gotta get down to the bus stop. Gotta catch my bus. I see my friends kicking in the front seat. Sitting in the back seat. Gotta make my mind up. Which seat can I take? It's Friday, Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. Don't worry, I'm not going to play the whole thing. People start to get upset at, at this point. It's like 10 seconds is all they can handle. So uh, this is a girl. Her name is Rebecca Black. At the time, she was 16 years old. Her parents paid $4,000 to a company called Arc Music Factory in LA to make her a song. Um, this song is pretty bad. Most people hate this song. Some people even call this song the worst song of all time, which in itself is sort of an accomplishment. If you could really make the worst song ever, that would be pretty impressive, right? <laughs> Yet this song has over 300 million views. So they're doing something right. What is it? So uh, someone was nice enough to share with me some data. This is data, and I, I love data, uh, for searches for Rebecca Black on YouTube over time. And if you look at it, what you see is it starts out, it goes up, it goes down, then it goes up again, goes down, goes up again, goes down. You take a closer look, you'll notice that the spikes aren't random. They're seven days apart from one another. <laughs> Anybody have any idea what day the spikes are on? Friday. Friday. This song is equally bad every day of the week. Bad on Monday, bad on Tuesday, bad on Wednesday, bad on Thursday. I've listened every day, I checked, bad on Friday. But Friday is a cue in the environment, an environmental reminder, what I'll call a trigger, to remind people to think about the song, to watch it, and to share it with others. And so it's not just if things have social currency, we have to be reminded to talk about them. And triggers remind us to talk and share. So if something is top of mind, it's going to be tip of tongue. If we're thinking about something, and the more we're thinking about something, the more we are going to be likely to talk about it and share it. So let me give you a couple more examples of this. Uh, and this helps go back to that issue I raised earlier with Cheerios and Disney World. Okay? This is the traffic, the number of mentions on Twitter for Cheerios by time of day. So you look by midnight, 4 a.m., 6 a.m., big spike around 8 a.m., goes down again, flat the rest of the day. This is not rocket science. When people eat Cheerios, they're more likely to talk about it. It's even shifted to the right a little bit on the weekend. Why? We sleep in, right? We eat breakfast later on the weekend. So one reason people talk about things, one trigger for a product is using that product. The more we use a product, the more we talk about it. And this is Disney World's problem. How many people have been to Disney World this year? Oh, this year. This year. Everybody got excited. Disney World. A couple people, right? Even if you go, you go maybe once every two, three years, unless you're a big Disney fanatic, you got married at Disney, you go back for your anniversary, it's okay if that's you, not a problem, right? But we don't go very often. When people come back from Disney World, they love to tell everyone else about it. Oh, we went on Space Mountain, and we took the kids, and we ate the turkey legs, they're really big, and <laughs> we ate the cotton candy, and it was great, and here are the pictures. And then a week later, they don't talk about it anymore, because there's nothing to remind them to talk about it. Cheerios is really boring. One of the most boring products we can think of, right? Really, really boring. But last time I checked, we eat breakfast every day of the week, 365 days of the year. And so there are lots of triggers to remind us of it, even if we don't eat Cheerios. And if you don't buy Cheerios, you wheel your grocery cart through the aisle and you see those boxes once every couple of weeks. Make it more likely you'll think about it and it's top of mind. Yeah? Where is that data coming from? 
Uh, this data is from a colleague of mine who has scraped a whole bunch of Twitter data. Um, I think it's, I think it's red, redlog.net, I believe is his address. But if you send me a note, I'm happy to, to point you directly to it. Um, but yeah, it's very neat data. And there's actually a number, Twitter has a stream, so you can collect some of it yourself. But he's done some analytics on it already, which is, which is nice. Um, so you might be saying, well, hold on. My product isn't used very often. How else can I create triggers? It's not just using the product that's a trigger. Other cues in the environment, other stimuli can act as triggers. So if I said peanut butter and jelly, or if I said rum and Coke, peanut butter's like a little advertisement for jelly. There's no jelly on the screen, but every time you see peanut butter, you think of its friend jelly. Every time you think of rum, you think of its friend Coke. Every time you think about cats, you're more likely to think about dogs. And so stimuli in the environment can trigger us to think about other things, even though those things aren't there. Even though Friday is not Rebecca Black Day, Friday the Day made us think about Friday the Song, which made us go search for it. This is why a few years ago, Michelob had a campaign, Weekends Are Made for Michelob. Really simple. They wanted people to think about the beer on the weekend. Corona's done the same thing to the beach. I challenge you to go on a beach vacation and be on the beach and have a beer and not drink a Corona. It's really hard to do, right? That's the first thing that comes to mind. You have to say, no, no, I don't want that. I want something else, because they've connected those two things together. So in terms of applying this concept, two things. First of all, consider the context. Different environments have different stimuli in them. In the book, I talk about an example of a $100 cheesesteak. It's, uh, it's a restaurant in Philadelphia. They have a $100 cheesesteak. It has Kobe beef. It has lobster. It has truffles. It comes with a half bottle of champagne. It is a remarkable experience. But not only is it remarkable, it's triggered frequently in Philly because Philly's known for cheesesteaks. Not such a good fit in Seattle, unless I haven't lived here, I don't know, but I don't think there's many cheesesteak places in Seattle. So you're not thinking about cheesesteaks as often. You need to consider the context. Meow Mix is a great name for a cat food. Right? You got a hungry cat, it's going to say meow, that's going to make you think of Meow Mix. Right? Perfect name for a cat food. But also you want to think about finding prevalent triggers. Not just any triggers, but triggers that are really frequent. So Kit Kat had a great campaign a couple years ago called Kit Kat and Coffee. Really simple. Sales were down. They wanted to make people think about Kit Kat. They said, having a coffee break, think about a Kit Kat. Thinking about a coffee, think about Kit Kat. Trying to pair those two things together. Coffee's a great trigger for Kit Kat, not just because of the alliteration and not just because they taste good together, but because it's a frequent trigger in the environment. People drink coffee what? Some of you are probably even drinking coffee now. I see a couple folks, right? Multiple times a day, which increases the chance they think about Kit Kat multiple times a day. And so you don't just want to find any trigger, you want to find prevalent ones. It would be like Rebecca Black, instead of her calling her song Friday, it was called Leap Day. Leap Day, Leap Day, something, something, Leap Day. Right? Equally terrible song, but much less likely to be popular because you think about it less frequently. Leap Day comes around less often. With Michelob, their slogan actually, by the way, originally was holidays are made for Michelob. But they changed it to weekends because weekends are more frequent. Okay, so that's triggers. Um, I'm not going to talk about emotion. There's some fun examples there. Uh, we'll skip that. I'm not going to talk about public. I'm not going to talk about practical value. They're all in the book if you're interested. I want to skip to last but not least, uh, for the last couple minutes, to talk about stories. And so I want to talk about the difference between information and stories and why people tell stories in the first place. So imagine we've just met, and I walked up to you and I said, hey, did you know that Subway has five subs under five grams of fat? Did you know? You would look at me like I was crazy, right? Why am I bringing that up out of the blue? But I'd be happy to probably bring up a story. Does everyone know the Jared story? This guy Jared lost about 200 pounds basically eating Subway sandwiches. Way overweight in college. His roommate said, you need to do something different. Started going on a Subway diet. Ate Subway for lunch and dinner every day essentially for six months. Lost a whole bunch of weight. Okay, went from that size pants to that smaller size pants. But think about what you learned in this story. What information did you learn about Subway along the way during this story? Healthy? What else? Tastes good? Does it have only one healthy option? Probably not. Choices, you can go there for three to six months and not get bored. All the stuff that's over there is hidden in there. This story is what I'll call a Trojan horse. Remember the story of the Trojan horse? The idea of the Greeks, uh, Greeks and Trojans, Greeks hid inside the horse. Good stories are like Trojan horses. There's always something hidden inside. Whether it's a message, whether it's information, whether it's a brand, there's an exterior candy shell. No one wants to act as an advertisement for Subway, but they'll tell this story because it's engaging, it's remarkable, and the brand's hidden inside. The brand and the information comes along for the ride. <laughs> so the idea behind stories is that good stories allow information to travel under the guise of idle chatter. 
So what you need to do is you need to build your own Trojan horse. You need to build a story or narrative that people share because it has social currency or because it has practical value, but along the way it carries your message for the ride. It carries your brand or your benefit along the way. If you think about what Blendtec did, that ad was really funny, right? Their, or their message was really funny. Everybody liked it. But along the way, you learned something about Blendtec. What did you learn? Indestructible. indestructible. Which is, if you're a Blender company, something you want to be. That's the benefit they want consumers to remember. They hid that inside a broader message, right? That video is a Trojan horse for that benefit. Let me give you two more examples of this. Um, so we talked about Will It Blend. The key, though, is to make your brand or your benefit integral. Right? This is an example. Uh, this company, GoldenPalace.com, did a publicity stunt a few years ago. They paid this guy. He broke into the Athens Olympics. He jumped off the high dive wearing that tutu and those polka dot tights. Everybody talked about it. No one talked about GoldenPalace.com because GoldenPalace.com has nothing to do with breaking into the Olympics. And so you need to make sure that that brand or that benefit is integral to the story. Right? That detail is important to the narrative. It's like the murder, mystery in a, uh, the murder weapon in a mystery novel. You have to remember what that is. That's part and parcel of the story. Let me give you one more example. This is my favorite. This will be my closer here. Has anyone seen Panda Cheese before? Nobody. OK, good. My job, my goal in life is to make this famous. I think you'll like it. See what you, see what you think. It's not cheese made out of panda milk. That would be even more remarkable. It's a company named Panda that makes cheese. Please. Can I make you a cheese sandwich? No, thanks. I'm not hungry. Never say no to Panda. I'm going to show you a couple of these. Good morning. Good morning. I got you Panda cheese for breakfast. No, thanks. I don't, I don't feel well. Never say no to panda. Dad, why don't we get some panda cheese? Enough, that's too much already. Now we got a sense of where this is going. <laughs> Last one, I promise. Daddy, why don't we get some panda? Just you know why. Get one. Get one more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm glad you all lie. I love that ad. I think it's hilarious. I, I hope you share it. Uh, it's one of my favorites. But I want to point two things out about, about this ad. First of all, it's funny, and that's one reason that people share things. So as we talk about in the book, uh, humor drives people to share, but it's not just humor. It's any high arousal emotion. Anger, anxiety, excitement, all emotions that activate us, whether they're positive or negative, drive us to share. So that's one reason I showed this to you. But the second one is actually more important. This video was funny, but it would have been equally funny if it was for Joe's used cars, right? We never, never say no to a good deal at Joe's used cars. If the guy was dressed in a giraffe suit or an alligator suit or any sort of suit, people in suits tipping over grocery carts and pulling the plug on someone at the hospital are funny, right? They're hilarious. It's a good example because I challenge you to tell someone else about this and not mention the word panda. You can't. Panda is an integral detail to this story. This is a perfect Trojan horse for the Panda Cheese brand. Great story, great candy shell on the outside, but along the way, the brand's coming along for the ride. No one likes to be someone sharing an advertisement. You don't want to sell Panda Cheese. You're just giving something funny to your friends. But along the way, people are learning about this new brand called Panda Cheese. Great example of building a Trojan horse.
OK, so just to wrap up, word of mouth drives things to catch on. Not just online, not just viral videos. I love viral videos. They're cute. I like cats also. But it's not about the technology. It's not about cat. Then it's not just about online. It's about understanding the psychology that drives people to share. And unless we understand why people talk about and share things or what makes things talkable, it's going to be hard to design products and ideas that our people are going to share. So what we talked about today was six key ways to do this, six key steps to boosting word of mouth. We talked about social currency, the idea that people talk about things that make a, them look good, that hidden bar, please don't tell, right, or that remarkable video, will it blend? We talked about triggers. Rebecca Black is terrible. I agree with you. But it does better on Friday because people are triggered to think about it. Just like peanut butter is an advertisement for jelly, Friday the day became a trigger for Friday the song. We didn't talk about emotion, but you can read about it in the book. We didn't talk about public. The idea there is more observable things are easier to imitate. Practical value is all about useful information. You can read more about that as well. But finally, that key concept is stories, wrapping a narrative around that information. No one likes to share advertisements. No one likes to talk about features. But if the story's really good, if it makes them look good, if it activates a lot of emotion like humor, if it has useful information, people will share it. But along the way, the brand or the benefit can come inside that Trojan horse and go along for the ride. Thank you guys very much. So um, I know some of you may have to leave. We have books in the back. I'm happy to stick around for 20 or so minutes, 15 minutes, to answer any questions. Um, and if you have to go, please check out jonaberger.com if you're interested in research. And you can follow me on Twitter as well. I saw your hand first. Yeah. Do you use anything to do with the book cover? They don't, actually. Um, I love fun sneakers. And I wish I could find some that are actually orange on the bottom. These are more pink. Oh, I, I, don't, I can't put my foot over my head. Um, I wish I was that flexible. But uh, maybe if I stand back really far, people can see them, maybe? No? They're, they're black on top and pink on the bottom. They're sort of like a mullet, like business in the front and party. Yeah, anyway. Yes? So you talk a lot, a lot about products. Yes. What about services? How these applies to services? Yes. So um, really, this is about psychology. And I use ads as an example, because we can all relate to ads. We've, we've all seen ads. Um, but the same thing drives people to talk about services and B2B. Sometimes people say, oh, well, hold on. These are B2C. B2C is always fun, but B2B is harder. Right? No one would share B2B things. The word of mouth doesn't drive B2B sales. We actually look at the data. B2B mostly driven by word of mouth. That's the main thing that drives sales in B2B. 91% by a Forrester research estimate of sales in B2B are driven by word of mouth. And you may say, well, hold on. Maybe it's not all about uh, social currency, but definitely things like practical value right, are one thing that drives people to share in that space. There's a great example recently I saw. You might know Gorilla Glass. Does anyone know Gorilla Glass from Corning? Right, that's in the, in the B2B space. It's not directly B2C, but they have these great clips where people are shown trying to break the Gorilla Glass and throwing things at it, and it bounces right off. That's remarkable, and it also shows the usefulness of the practical value here. And so it's less about services or B2B or B2C and more about the psychology. I think if you think about services, the same reasons, right, if it's a useful service, I think it's time to talk about it here. If it's a service that makes you look good, you'll be more likely to talk about it. So anything that has these psychological drivers will get talked about and shared regardless of exactly what type of product it is. Some of these may matter more in a service space and less in a different space. But the drivers, at least what we've seen, are, are the same. Yeah? So we want all these six drivers to be present ideally. Or would a story have elements of everything? So I like to talk about this like a Cobb salad. And a Cobb salad is like one of the best inventions ever, in, in my opinion. It's one of my favorite things to order. So, but if you think about a Cobb salad, it has lots of toppings, right? It has that cheese. It has the tomatoes. It has uh, bacon. Don't forget the bacon. It's got turkey. It has eggs. All those things are good. It's best when all of them are there, but it's still pretty good even when one isn't there. And so I would say the same here. The more of these ingredients you can include, the better your recipe, the better your outcome will be. But even if you can't include all of them, that's OK. But what I would say is sometimes people say, ah, we can easily do one of these. We'll just do that one. The best examples come from trying to do the dimensions that are hard. Right? Will it blend could have said, well, great, we're useful. We blend stuff. But there's no way we're going to have social currency. There's no way we're going to be remarkable. Let's give up on that one. And they did so well because they figured out a way to be remarkable. right? Because no one would have thought a blender could have done something like that. And so what I would suggest to you if you're trying to apply these ideas, and by the way, on the website is a workbook, a free workbook anyone can download. It's a companion to the book. It helps you apply these ideas. Um, I use it in my class to help teach the concepts. But it helps you work through these different principles and really pushing on all of them. Maybe you can't get all of them with your team, but at least pushing on it, I think, leads to better outcomes overall. Yeah? With your figure of 7% of word about being online, do you count email as online? Email is online, yes. And, and by the way, that's not, I did not. The mouse. You say word of mouth. Uh, you were saying, did you say word of mouse? No, no, 
Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's actual talking, is what you're saying, 93%. Yes, and, and by the way, that's not my study. It's actually from a group uh, called the Keller Fay Group. They're basically the Nielsen of word of mouth, so they do diary research and other things to collect information about what people talk about across the course of the day. Um, and they suggest that it's, it's only 7%. Um, again, everyone thinks that number's wrong when you first hear it. They think there's no way it's 7%. I challenge you, take a recorder with you and just record what happens on a daily basis, or even just write down what you talk about across the course of the day. You'll be surprised how much stuff you talk about offline. Well, the key part is that it's growing, though. The new pope is actually on Twitter. Part of yeah. the Well, the new pope is on Twitter is, is true, but that doesn't mean that more word of mouth is online compared to offline. And I agree it's growing. It is. But think about it this way. How many hours do people spend online? By some estimates, even on average in the U.S., it's two to two and a half. That's sort of, sure. well, yeah. What I'm saying is that it takes a snapshot of point in time where that, that curve is, is different. I agree it's growing, but I think, and the only thing I would say, the only point I want to make here is don't forget about offline. I think in the, in the focus on online, we are going after online. Everyone wants to be on social media, and that's good. It's not a bad thing. But don't forget all those offline conversations, because there's a lot of those, too. Other questions? Yeah. How do you uh, apply this to a big idea and getting traction, traction, traction on, yeah. say, a, a Kickstarter or a Reddit or a big project, like a big science project? Um, maybe it's not a product or a service, but just an idea. Like what sort of idea? Uh, build a space-based antenna to communicate to Mars. OK. That sounds very specific. With the internet. <laughs> yeah, that's a big problem with planetary internet communication and space travel and space exploration right now. OK. So I mean, so I talked here mostly about products, because we can all relate to products. I talk about a number of services in the book or nonprofits or ideas. The same, so uh, there's a great example of Movember. Does anyone know Movember? Yeah, so it's a great example of, and it's more the, the public dimension here, but using these concepts, nonprofits are really hard. Donations are hard. No one can see what anyone else is donating to. How do you make it public that people are doing it? Well, they did mustaches, right? And now when someone who never think would grow a mustache is growing a mustache, you go, why are you growing a mustache? And they say, oh, I'm raising money, and now you know about it as well. And so I think these principles are, are pretty universal. You have to think about how to apply them to your idea in particular, right? So you said, I think, inner... inner so Ben Cerf did a, a talk about the, the problem of why TCP is terrible for interplanetary communication. Okay. And how would you take and apply these principles to sort of a grassroots engineering effort to fund the science, yeah. to launch the stuff to start solving that? So what I would start to think about, right, that sounds like a pretty remarkable thing, right? So I'd put that under social currency. How can we show people how remarkable this was? What if this thing were, were able to be happened? What if we could do it? How would that change the way we live our lives? I think it would change it pretty significantly. That sounds pretty remarkable. Maybe it's about getting people emotional. We actually found the New York Times, one of the most email sections of the Times is the science section. You'd say, why are people sharing science? It's the emotion of awe. Right? It's inspiration. This sounds pretty inspirational, right? So figuring out how to inspire people with this message. Building a story around it, right? So other sorts of things. So it's the same concepts but thinking about how to apply them in this particular case. So sometimes ideas are a little harder because there's no physical instantiation. But even with Movember, they figured out a way to make donation behavior more public with a mustache. And so I think figuring out how to make behavior more public or show the emotion behind the idea is really key to getting it, getting it to spread. What yeah. was the um, inspiration or catalyst um, that began this research into the Times? What, what happened? Did, was there a trigger or something that happened that made you think, well, oh, you need to die? Oh, for me? Yeah. So, um, so I've been doing research on social influence for a long time now, for probably 10 years. Um, and I've published over 25 academic papers in the space, everything from whether negative publicity is good or bad and when it is, to why baby names become popular and die out, all sorts of things related to social influence. Um, and I'll tell you a little story, if, if we have a second. Um, so uh, I was in graduate school, and I would read the Wall Street Journal every once in a while. And it used to be on the inside page of the Wall Street Journal. There was a little list of the most viewed and the most uh, shared articles in the, in the Wall Street Journal. So I would go down to the library every day at night. In graduate school, we had access to the library at night. When I was around, I'd take my scissors, and I'd cut out these articles. And I started making a stack of them, a stack of which were the five most read and five most shared articles. And I was like, OK, I'll do some analysis on it. And of course, you're sitting there going, there's no way you can do this. And you were right. right? I started looking for parallels. I couldn't find them. A colleague of mine suggested a much better idea. She was like, let's build a web crawler. So we did. We did it for the Times, because the Times is a bigger paper. It has a larger readership. Um, we collected everything that came out on the Times homepage for, you know, every day for six months. And then we started doing the analysis. And so I think it's, to me at least, talking is something we do all the time. We don't even think about it. It's almost like breathing or eating. It's like, oh, yeah, talking. But if you think about it, we do it a whole lot. 
Um, but we don't really have much of an understanding about why we talk about one thing rather than another. So this was sort of a more business-focused talk, how to apply these things. But I think it's equally interesting just as a person, right? If you're sitting down at lunch, why do people bring up certain stories rather than others? Or why do certain emails get in your inbox about, oh, this Ford and that Ford? You know, my mother's always sending me 10 superfoods I should be eating. Or, oh, you know, Trader Joe's just recalled this peanut butter, just so you know. Right? When you start to think about these things, you actually, I started a folder, I start putting them in there, you start to see a lot of these concepts coming up in this, in this space. And so for me, I, I like looking around the world and seeing puzzles in people um, and like bringing science to them. And so this for me was just one, one way to do that. Anybody else? Okay, great. Thank you guys so much. I'll stay around after to sign books if you're interested uh, or chat. And otherwise, have a great day. <laughs>